Hello, my name is Michael Cherry uh, with the Division of Scientific Education and Professional Development with the Preventive Medicine uh, Residency and Fellowship Program and Population Health Training in Place Program at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, welcome to Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds for February 1st, 2023. Um, I'm uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Peter Elkin, um, who serves as the University of Buffalo Distinguished Professor and Chair of the University of Buffalo Department of Biomedical Informatics to speak today. Dr. Elkin has published over 200 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. He received his Bachelor of Science from Union College and his uh, MD degree from New York Medical College. He did a NIH-sponsored um, fellowship in medical informatics at Harvard Medical School and the Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Elkin has been working in biomedical informatics since 1981 and has been actively researching uh, health big data science since 1987. Dr. Elkin is a master of the American College of Physicians and a fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics and a fellow of the New York Academy of Medicine. He was awarded the Mayo Department of Medicine's Laureate Award for 2005. And Dr. Elkin is the index recipient of the Homer R. Warner Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Fields of Medical Informatics. Dr. Elkin is an internationally renowned expert in knowledge representation, ontology, natural language processing, and health IT standards. In 2018, Dr. Elkin received the Team Science Award from the National Center for Advancement of Translational Sciences and was elected as inaugural fellow for the American Medical Informatics Association for Clinical Informatics Excellence, has been elected to the International Academy of Health Science Informatics. He serves as co-chair of the NCATS IEC and of the NCATS Informatics Quality Metrics Committee. He publishes the Springer Series textbook on terminology, ontology, and their implementations, and he's been elected to the AMIA Board of Directors. Now, the findings and, and conclusions in this presentation are those of the presenters and do not reflect the views of uh, CDC or the Preventive Medicine Residency Program. But Dr. Elkin, uh, the floor is yours to give your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Cherry, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm very excited and honored to be here. And I thank you all for your um, for for your uh, attention. Um, if you're not speaking, please mute your line. Um, that's important because uh, we have lots of people on the line. Um, so I, as stated, I'm a clinician and an investigator, and I chair the Department of Biomedical Informatics. I also have appointments in internal medicine, uh, psychiatry, orthopedics, surgery, and uh, and psychiatry here at the University of Buffalo. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk to you about today really is about human-computer partnerships. It's not about people or machines doing things. It's about us doing things together with machines. And there's lots of different types of artificial intelligence. We're going to go through quite a few of these just to get you to understand the field a little bit better and see what these are used for and what some of the concerns are around them. So you probably remember the... Um, the Institute of Medicine at the time, it's now National Academy of Medicine's report to air as human, but you really takes a machine to mess things up and that's really true. So you have to really watch how you do AI so that it doesn't actually give you bad answers. What we're really looking to do is have AI be for social good. And that means it needs a strong ethical basis around it. And without that ethical basis, you really can't be sure that you're not going to cause harm. And the United States is not publishing the most articles in artificial intelligence. Actually, China's way ahead of us in terms of, of their work in artificial intelligence. Uh, but we have lots of great data. And that was something that makes us strong in, in the United States, particularly. We have very good curated data sets, including the biomedical literature and Medline. We also at uh, UB, we have a number of different AI programs, everything from surgery to predicting cancer diagnoses to classifying benign versus malignant lesions and cancer. Um, and, and then the whole idea is that you have an interdiscipline of artificial intelligence and all of these fields around it that use that in order to create artifacts that can be used to make life better. This is one of my favorite slides because it shows you that you always have this core of AI methods, and then around it, you'll have a disciplinary core of knowledge that's related to your discipline. And then you need uh, another barrier of legal, social, and ethical issues that help to limit what can and should be done 
within this disciplinary core. And only after that sanctioning do we build applications and try to make it safe in that way. And the idea is to advance knowledge and to make human life better. So the definition of artificial intelligence started out as an expert system, which was a program that symbolically encoded concepts derived from experts in a field and used that knowledge to provide the kind of problem analysis and advice that an expert might provide. The key here is it was using heuristics or rules of thumb or methods of reasoning with only partial evidence. And the way these were built, they were built in three ways. One for in tools for information management, tools for focusing attention, like abnormal lab results and uh, pharmacy drug-drug interactions, and then tools for patient-specific consultation, which is often what we think of when we think of uh, artificial intelligence. So when you think about the history of this, it really dates back to around 1959, where Ledley and Lusted published a paper, I believe, in the New England Journal, um, anticipating the possibility that machines would be able to assist in making diagnoses. Back in 1964, Homer Warner created the first experimental prototype, clinical decision support. And in, in London, uh, in 1972, Tim Dodomble, the University of Leeds, created the first abdominal pain diagnosis program to find appendicitis. In 1976, Ted Shortliff from our country, who was at Stanford at the time, created Mycin, which was the first antibiotic management system. And now every single hospital, I think in the world, not just in our country, uses a, a computer-based antibiotic management system that takes care of everything from what's the most appropriate um, antibiotics for a patient given the, the antibiogram in that region, but also what's most cost-effective. And then in 1979, Homer Warner actually integrated the clinical decision support with a hospital information system at LDS Hospital in Utah. In 1986, uh, Randy Miller and Jack Myers created the Internist One that became QMR, which was the first diagnostic engine. And by 87, my boss, Octo Barnett, created DXplain, which was another uh, attempt at the same thing that was broader, but not as deep as the first effort by, by uh, Myers and Miller. And in 1988, not to be outdone, Homer Warner created a pure Bayesian system named Iliad, and I believe these are all still on the market and you can get them. So the way the algorithms worked is the weight was basically the disease important times the prevalence times what would be the a weighted um, positive likelihood ratio. And this uh, <clears throat> this used uh, positive and negative results with the weighting scores uh, with, uh, you know, five out of 10 being neutral. And you guys should all know by now the idea of what prevalence is, right? The rate in a particular population or incidence, the number of new cases that arise over time in a population. And then sensitivity is the true positive rate over the true positive plus false negative rate. The specificity is the true negative over the true negative plus the false positive rate. Positive predictive value, true positives over the true positive plus the false positives. And the, ne true, the negative predictive value is the true negatives over the true negatives plus the false negatives. And this is, relates all to a standard two by two table where you have the person who has the disease and they don't and a test for it. Uh, which tests positive and a test for it, that same test testing negative. Um, this is very important for all students to know, and you should know this. It's on every board exam you'll ever see, and it's important that you understand these. What people don't use as much, but is just as important, is how you get to pre- and post-test probability. So let's say you are trying to understand, given a test, um, what my... Uh, my post-test probability of disease will be. And the way you get to that is you take your pretest probability and you divide it by one over the pretest probability to get the pretest odds. You take the pretest odds, you multiply it times the positive likelihood ratio and get the post-test odds. And then you take those post-test odds and divide them uh, by the post-test odds plus one and you get the post-test probability. And this can tell you, regardless of what your thresholds are for action, whether a particular test will meet those thresholds or not. And it's uh, it, it this math applies 
many more times than people use it in the practice. And you're going to start to see this integrated more and more into EMRs that doctors will use and be able to, to choose the right tests given their thresholds for action and the patient's pretest probability of disease. So I ask you guys, how much should a clinician be expected to remember and how much should the computer be able to provide decision support to his or her practice? Well, there are about 6,000 articles published every week, uh, thousands of ongoing clinical trials. On average, a clinical guidelines about 67 pages long. Um, on average, new patient visits are 30 to 45 minutes and follow-ups are 15 to 30 minutes. And the average elderly patient has at least six clinical problems. In my practice, it's more like 23. And clinicians make hundreds of decisions every week. So it's very difficult to stay on top of things. I read 60 articles last week. I got 5,940 behind. That's, that's awe-inspiring. All right. So what is the level of medical error and harm that is acceptable to expect from a, cl a practicing clinician. Um, let's see, is there, I don't know if I can see the chat from here, but um, can anybody tell me what they think is the right level of harm that you can expect from doctors? I'm trying to let's see if I can see the chat. I can't see the chat over here. Um, Anybody in the audience want to put it into the chat, what they think the right level is for a practicing clinician? For medical error, let's say, first. Come on, don't be shy. Just put it into the chat. We'll see it. Lillian, I'm not hearing you clearly. Um, I don't want to open the chat to press get more than a few seconds. Oh, they can't see the chat? Mm -hmm. Okay. You, Is, you might want to use your microphone from your computer and just unplug your um your headsets and just use the microphone. Oh, that, okay. You know, Let's see. Uh, they're using the questions, so that's good. Yeah, I've got a bunch of people who put the Q&A in there. That's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it with your names on it. So, so is when you're doing this, this is for medical error. And how much uh, do you think is is what people are doing for harm? So I see some right answers coming in here. So if we look at the data, so Joanne and John got this right. If you look at the rate in hospital of medical error, it's about 6%. And about 17% of those cause harm. So that's about 1% of everything we do causes harm. So let's say out of 100 things that a practicing clinician does, 99 will be good and one will be bad that they do. So in addition to doing things that are good for patients, we also create harm. It's possible. So what would it take for clinicians to perform with Six Sigma accuracy? So Six Sigma accuracy is parts per million. So let's say you're getting on a plane and I told you that there's a 1% chance that that plane will crash. I bet you every single one of you will just get up and walk off that plane because that is an unacceptably high risk. But yet you'll go in the hospital when the chance of harm is 1% in the hospital, right? So we want to get that down to parts per million, which is where we are with, with airline flight. So now that your chance of crashing is, what, six in a million or something, you go, well, that's a very low risk. I think I can take that risk and I'll get on the plane. But, you know, we don't have that kind of security in healthcare, and we need to do it. And in order to do it, we need to make use of all of our available tools and, and create clinical workflows that support best practice of medicine. And then we need integrated clinical decision support at that level of diagnosis, workup strategies, treatment protocols. And then we need to do biosurveillance and outcome surveillance in order to know that we're meeting our goals and when situations change, respond to that. And we need improved communication pathways so that we're messaging people the way that we like to be messaged and not in some other way. 
And machine learning is one way to do that. So this is a formal definition. I'm not going to read it for machine learning. But basically what it means is you have to have an, something you can measure that you know the answer to in order to do this well. Uh, or you can do uh, unsupervised machine learning where you don't know the answers and you just find out what all the correlations are. Um, so let's talk about the different classes of machine learning. So the, uh, the one that uh, most people talk about is supervised learning. That's where you know the right answer. You've had experts look at it and give you the right answer. And you train the computer based on differentiating the things that are true from the things that are false. And then you have unsupervised learning where there's no labels. You don't know. You just find all the correlations between every single variable in the data set together. And uh, then when you want to find outcomes, you can use the things that are most predictive of that outcome. And then uh, you can, there's an in-between state called semi-supervised learning, which is what we usually have, where you have a small amount of labeled data because Experts are expensive and large amounts of labeled data costs a lot of money to produce. Um, and then you first train on the labeled data and then you train on the unsupervised data to strengthen it so that you have the, the power of the large N, but you also have the directed influence of the labeled data to help you create your models. And you do this in an ensemble approach where you can do both and add them together. And then you have reinforcement learning. So one of the beautiful things about machine learning is it can continue to take feedback and get better. And one of the things I've been counseling as I gave grand rounds at the FDA was that they cannot continue to approve algorithms as they are, and that's it. And then they have to come back when there are any changes. They have to approve the algorithm and a method for learning so that they can continue to get better over time. And they, they have to become comfortable with this new way of doing things because it's the world we live in. Um, and I think that that uh, will help our machine learning algorithms over time grow toward uh, a much more accurate state. So one of the more popular methods is random forest. Uh, one of the common ones used is XGBoost or AdaBoost. And these are types of decision trees. It's a tree bragging out or bagging algorithm where you get things that are close to each other and other things that are close. And then these groups are closer to other groups than some of their neighbors. And this is, and then you can resample um, and, and retest to get rid of type one error, which is, uh, which is positive results by random chance alone. And then um, you can, you know, do these subsets, which are trees, and all of a sudden build in neighborhoods and forests. And for those of you who like math, the formula is at the bottom of the screen. And then uh, there are naive Bayesian classifiers. Now, naive Bayesian classifiers are based on conditional probabilities, and the prior probability is used to weight the current findings. And the key about this is that it's um, it's explainable. Whereas some of the other methods like random forest or deep learning are not explainable methods, um, although we have ways to try to back propagate through the model, um, they're, they're theoretically not explainable. Um, and here uh, we, uh, we have an explainable method that we can use if need be. So here's the formula for naive Bayes. And you read this, you know, what's the probability of C of K given X? You know X to be true. And that's uh, this probability here. The best way I like to remember this is this is the prior probability uh, is equal to the prior probability times the likelihood ratio over the evidence, which is a nice, easy way to remember the, the power of naive Bayes. So it turns out that we've had electronic records for a long time. The first systems were the help system in Utah and CoStar at MGH. Um, and then the first commercial systems came out in 63. Uh, and this uh, um, actually became the TDS system. And this system actually was shown to kill babies because of a problem that occurred with its implementation. And it was implemented differently later, and it actually did better. But what happened was that before they implemented the system, they were able to take input from ambulances and order medicines and have them waiting for the babies when they came in by ambulance. 
and after the system was employed, it only let you put in orders once you registered the patient. So they couldn't do it till the patient hit the door. And that caused an hour and a half delay in, in getting meds for the, pa for the patients who needed them. And that led directly to eight deaths. Um, and uh, this fellow Han published this. Uh, they, he lost his job over it, interestingly, uh, but got another job and he's just fine now. But it was a real travesty of academia that, that things went that way. Um, and then Meditech came out in 1969. We still have that in our county hospital. Uh, mumps was developed as a standard in 1977. It came out of the lab that later became the M language that's used in the VA and it's used in Epic and other systems that, that you guys probably are well aware of. In 1979, Epic started as an outpatient system, and, in, and the same year, Cerner started as a pure lab system. Um, in the 80s, Boston Beth Israel created their own uh, their own electronic health record system, as did the Reagan Street Institute at, in Indiana. And then the VA got into this with DHCP um, in um, 1981, and that became Vista and CPRS as their interface, and now they're transitioning to Cerner. Um, and then, of course, there was the ERA EHR Act to get everybody to to uh, start adopting electronic health records. And although we thought that there might be quality of care um, reasons for this, a lot of it was economic, you know, the rationale for doing this. There are lots of, of sources of unstructured data that include documents, reports, legends and figures, tabular data names, fields and databases. And some of the data is only available in unstructured data, social determinants of health. Uh, although there are surveys that are coming out now like the ACORN survey that are quite helpful, but the knowledge representation to represent them to be read by a computer is not quite there yet. Signs and symptoms, physical findings, counseling, quality of life issues, behavioral data, street drug use, and opinions and goals are only available in uh, unstructured data. So we created an NLP system that's very fast that does that called high definition uh, NLP. And um, it's very easy to use. It's got an input queue, output queue, you look for your jobs, you put it through. Uh, and it, it bolts on to observational databases in a big data lake. Um, and uh, of course, MLP can be challenging, so nothing's perfect and neither is ours, but it does very, very well in terms of the mapping. And basically, it's basically an input processor, which takes your input format and breaks it into sections of the record. It has a full semantic parse and memory, and then it does ontologic tagging of uh, any ontologies you want. And then it has an output processor for where to store it or who to send it to based on your needs. And it uses ontology. Ontology, the best way I can describe ontology is it allows formal definitions of entities that you talk about such that you can have multiple and consistent views of the same data to, to handle the multiple perspectives that your users come to the data for. For example, this is a clinical view of diabetes and the organs that it, it uh, affects. Here's a basic science view of diabetes that just is valid. And no matter how you get to this data, you should see the same uh, basic uh, relationships. And that, in order to keep that straight, one requires an ontologic approach. So we use the basic formal ontology as our upper level ontology here in Buffalo and the ontology for general medical sciences as the way to describe courses of illness. And then we use SNOMED, LOINC, and RxNorm as the, as the detailed um, terminologies that are our national standard. SNOMED is a, uh, is a representation of general medicine. Uh, LOINC is an, a representation of sections of the record and laboratory test names uh, and result names. And, uh, and RxNorm is, is a drug naming database that helps us to understand all the parts of the drug name, both generic and uh, brand names.
And then we go ahead and we build it into sentences. So we take entities, relationships, and semantic triples, and we'll build them into sentences and give them identifiers that you can reuse. And the reason for this is that these can be built into networks, and networks are what are needed to really represent the kind of information that we use in medicine at the granularity in which we practice. And then we use it to train our, our uh, machine learning algorithms. So what we did was we took the structure of how we talk in medicine, which we use SNOMED for. And then we took evidence-based medicine, we took clinical guidelines, we took um, Medline Plus, which is the uh, these descriptions and treatment from the National Library of Medicine. And then we took um, real cases and order sets and clinical pathways and, and added those in to the model. And then only then did we add to it uh, data that we wanted to train. And we did an experiment where we we trained data on the same database. There's 170,000 people from New York State that had were opioid users that had gone through uh, treatment of either alcohol or opioid by the state in our Oasis treatment centers. And we took them and we wanted to predict in this opioid using population overdose events and death events. And we did this uh, with the uh, ensemble training where you used medical knowledge and we did it just from the data, same data, but just with the data alone. And what we found was that the people that had um, the, um, the ontology-based uh, medical knowledge that was included were more accurate and, and more resistant to bad data. So, um, and it, there was a big difference between the two groups and then we did an experiment, which is really fun. We took data away from each thing at certain percent of the data, and then we added back bad data at a certain percent. And what you can see in the blue lines is that the ones with the uh, ensemble training that had medical knowledge degraded much more slowly than the ones that did not have the medical knowledge. And the, the important thing for you to understand there is that when a physician sees a patient, they're not seeing them la tabla rasa. They've got all their medical knowledge and the prior, prior cases they've seen at their disposal. And, um, and in, in this case, um, we, uh, when we get, let the computer have the same advantages, it performed much better. And I think that's the future for machine learning algorithms is built on a basis of medical knowledge. This was a, a fun study. We looked at what... Um, specialties in medicine were the um, hardest to get along with um, and uh, and and how much feedback helped in making them better. This was published in surgery and uh, it's an interesting article if you want to see it. I mean the, it reinforced your uh, thinking in that uh, you know uh, some of the hardest fields to get along with were, uh, neurosurgery, cardiology, orthopedics in this particular study, for example. I thought that was a fun study. I just thought I'd show you for comedy relief. So level three ontologies are the fully encoded clinical record. And this is what we do in our NLP, where we completely encode all the medical concepts from it. And then we build networks from it that are compositional expressions that are... Um, are able to be um, are able to be used as a network and therefore are computable. And you know we do this for different sections of the record. So for the history, we get quite a bit and and link them together from the physical exam. And uh, you can see there's we don't get everything, but we get most of the data. This is from an a, uh, a actual study that was being done in our area of adolescents with type 1 diabetes. You can see most of the data is obtained. Um, and we've started to put genomic data in there so you can do clinical genomic work in a, an interface called the BMI investigator, which I'll talk about. And we have new modeling for social determinants of health, which we think can be quite helpful. And we're going to be building uh, machine learning algorithms to identify important clinical outcomes based on differences in social determinants of health uh, information. And uh, if you love this ontology stuff after this talk, uh, we I publish a book, it's Ontology uh, 
terminology and their implementations as the new version is called. It's coming out in Springer this month. Um, so this is the interface for the BMI investigator, biomedical informatics investigator, where you just type whatever you want and you get it. You can say what, what terminology you want to use for what. So if you're looking for diagnoses or procedures, you might use SNOMED for uh, lab test results, Loinkin for drugs, RxNorm in here. Um, but you can also search by codes as well. And it's got ICD-10 code searching and other things. And, and uh, uh, we put lots of data, real clinical data into this. Uh, a lot of people have used it. Um, and you can get answers back in a few seconds. And then immediately it comes up with some of the social determinants of health. So here's race, ethnicity, gender, and age distributions that come immediately uh, with one click after you get your results back. And you can do sub searches and you can, uh, you know, do inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, bring it back, call it the population, ask lots of questions of that population, save the models, bring them back, add to them, you know, that kind of thing. And you can exchange it with others and keep libraries, that sort of uh, belief. And then we created an EMR of EMRs because we had a lot of different EMRs in our region and we needed to look at all the data together. This is, uh, and and this is a, where we want to do a study. So part of the program allows you to define a set of variables that you want somebody who's reviewing the records to make comment about. And it it's saved in a relational database. Um, and you can click through here and get all of the information for a particular patient. Um, and we do genetic data and it, you can put in sequences or you can put in um, the gene name. So for example, if you have lung cancer patients, you want to know how many people are EGFR positive that might be a candidate for a tyrosine kinase inhibitor treatment, you can put it in here and you can find all those people associated with your knowledge base. And we're presently doing one on uh, image feature recognition as well. So a smart clinician came into my office and said, Peter, I think my patients who have rosacea are uh, more at risk of having obstructive sleep apnea. So I said, okay, well, let's check. So I looked at it and the chance of having obstructive sleep apnea without rosacea was only 2.6 percent with uh with rosacea was 8.8 percent the chi-square was highly statistically significant the relative risk was 3.4x and the number needed to test was only 12 so it was a pretty good it was a pretty good test actually and therefore um everybody should be asked the screening questions for obstructive sleep apnea who have rosacea and we've published this uh, we we found uh, the only treatment, uh, well, now there's a, one, one article that Paxlovid had some mortality benefit, but until that article came out, this was the only article from the Journal of Clinical and Translational Sciences and showed that leukotriene inhibitors, when added to dexamethasone, uh, decreased death by 13.5% inpatient. And if you were taking it before, it was 22 and a quarter percent, which are very large effect sizes. Um, and that's been published in, in that. Uh, the journal, of, like I said, of clinical and translational science, which is a good, has a good impact factor. And then um, we have a new one coming out, same journal, that there's trivial risk of venous thrombolism with vaccination and that the risk benefit ratio favors vaccination um, that uh, will be, it's in press, so it's going to be out any, any day now. Um, and then we have one going in probably this weekend, defining long COVID. And we also did what the risk factors were. We found that more severe cases of COVID um, uh, were more likely to produce long COVID. People who are unvaccinated had a higher risk of long COVID. People who had multiple comorbidities as seen in their Alexhauser scores had a higher risk of, of uh, long COVID. And of course we did our own thing. So not taking leukotriene inhibitors uh, gave you a higher risk of having uh, prolonged disease. We published uh, last year in uh, the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery uh, that uh, if you take metformin with stage one non-small cell lung cancer, that it gave you an 18% five-year survival advantage. That's better than most of the pay-for drugs, and it's cheap and easy to do. Um, so we like to think we changed practice. And uh, the idea is to work toward a learning health system where the data that we generate every day makes us smarter and we practice better every single day. And the idea is to try to speed the time it takes to go from bench to bedside. So 
Here, this is a way to get computational data and look at um, docking algorithms between uh, mole small molecules and uh, our um, systems biology that's important for a particular disease, and then bring it right to cell lines and organoids and right into phase one clinical trials much more rapidly than we could before. And we use a program called CANDU to do the docking against all of the known uh, proteins that we have structures for from the PDB uh, and can doc to look at that. And then there's uh, there are a number of papers on um, the uh, accuracy of the of the algorithm. This is one where we looked at uh, at pairs of drugs against um, bacteria that were found in COPD patients through bronchoalveolar lavage. And uh, we've also got a new non-narcotic pain reliever that's in clinical trials and looks in the animal work to be effective, and we're, we're moving it on to the next stage. We have tons of data sets in our place that people can use, and uh, a bunch of, uh, of people's data that, that we can use for research that I think are useful. So if you're working with us, we can get you access to the data and get on the IRBs. Um, and then we do a lot of work in addiction and opioid overdose. I know this is a very important problem for the CDC. And uh, we looked at it by age and, and race and gender. I'm just going to move ahead a little bit because we have a lot of slides to cover. And uh, we did it by a zip code. And interestingly enough, so this is these zip codes. Can you see my pointer here? Yeah. These are inner city zip codes, right? And there's a big problem with injectables. We have about 50,000 needles that are exchanged in our needle exchange every uh, week. And then there's the people over here. And those are in my neighborhood. They're more affluent neighborhood, um, tend to be Caucasian. Um, and uh, they're getting their narcotics usually in pill form from doctors. So this is not just a problem for the inner city. This is a problem for everybody. So some of the things we found that were really important are that um, our, uh, uh, let me just go ahead a little bit. These are the drugs that are used uh, most commonly when they're you know used. And here, yeah, here's the things that we found. So if you have a history of, uh, of alcohol use, you have 103 times the rate of overdose at, with uh, using narcotics. So narcotics and alcohol really don't mix. People who are African-American had a slightly higher uh, risk than Caucasians and, and Asians. Uh, but interestingly, if your first exposure to, to uh, treatment for acute pain was when you were less than 30, you had a 3.3 times more likely uh, uh, risk of becoming addicted, which we thought was an important thing. So if you're giving out uh, narcotics to people who are younger, realize that, that there's a much higher risk of long-term addiction. And these were all treatment for acute pain that, that were in this particular result. That's what I said here. So I wanted to talk a little bit about healthcare value, and we define value as quality over cost, and uh, that the this is composed of, you know, outcome, safety, service, and we need reliability of these functions. Uh, Kaplan and Norton said in their famous book, The Balanced Scorecard, you can't manage what you can't measure, you can't measure what you can't describe, and that's kind of how I got into ontology, uh, because I want to do all these things. And what we're doing in informatics is we're really taking people and technology and bring them together through process. Oh, this is the government health IT journal that said it was during the Obama administration. They said that my lab was doing exactly what the country needed. It was nice in some of my um, co-investigators. You guys probably are aware of Six Sigma and Lean technology, but may not be as aware of where it started. It, it came back all, this, all the way back to the Ford assembly line and then the Guinness Beer Brewery. So if you like the fact that you get standardized, uh, you know, mugs of beer from Guinness, this is the, the quality control is why. And 
And then Gilbreth uh, created management theory and industrial engineering. And shortly after that, a guy named Schuhart created uh, process control charts. And a student of his, Deming, uh, created the PDSA cycles and who is most commonly associated with, uh, with Six Sigma. Uh, and of course, he went off after the war to Japan and helped uh, the country rebuild and helped Toyota with its Toyota production system, who took basically the ideas of Deming and implemented them. And then these process control charts became total quality management and Motorola really introduced the idea of Six Sigma from this and a number of companies adopted it. At the same time, uh, lean manufacturing became uh, a deal and lean manufacturing or where you have value streams and anything that you're doing that's not contributing to the outcomes you need, you get rid of because it's just a source of error. And so, you know, Six Sigma is trying to get the parts, you know, the error rates down in the parts per million, right? So so between the two, you have maximizing quality and you have minimizing harm uh, in here as well. Now, Deming was a, a statistician and professor and author. He, uh, as I said, he worked in Japan and he was a pioneer, used statistical analysis to improve industrial control problems. And the he created the PDSA cycles or the Prop Plan, Do, Study, Act. And the way I, I like to think of this, it's the easiest way I can remember it, is what are we trying to accomplish? What's our goal? How do we know that the changes are an improvement? What can we measure that will know that we've met our outcomes? And then what changes can we make that will result in an improvement? And then this is a virtuous cycle. So, you know, of course, um, the Hippocratic Oath, one of the main stays of the Hippocratic Oath is above all else, do no harm. The other interpretation of the Hippocratic Oath I, I like, but it's not used very much anymore, is I will accept no payment before the cure. Uh, and in Hippocrates' time, there were a lot of charlatans out there, and one needed to differentiate themselves from people who were um, not very good healers. And then you need to build systems with safety barriers. That's the only way it's going to work. You can't expect that people are going to get too perfect. So why do advance, adverse outcomes continue to, to happen? Well, one theory is the Swiss cheese theory, where when, when all of your protections have holes that line up, then you can get to harm, which happens. But if if you have, and you do have holes in every protection you give, but when they're such that, that you have enough layers of protection that you can't get through in any one hole in any one direction, then you have a successful safety barrier, right? So, we need performance monitoring, and that means we have to have goals. And I think say we do it for best practice, not just for minimum standard of care, which is our what our guidelines are often today. And we need to use our national measurement systems to do that. Um, this was meaningful use for a while. HEDIS measures, PQRS, many of you have worked with. And we need to have our own practice goals for repractice so that we're doing a little better than what the country requires of us. And, and some of the measures we do because our healthcare payers want us to do them. And some of the measures we do because we're well-meaning and we want to do the best thing for our patients. And we have our own practice goals. And it requires monitoring in real time and on demand. So people understand probably the fishbone diagram when you're doing root cause analysis, but this says that we have a problem. We want to know what leads to that problem. What's the equipment, processes, people, materials, environment, management that has some direct correlation on the problem. And then there's also failure mode and effect analysis, which is where you have a team of experts who get data for analysis. They look at the failures and causes, critically assess it do risk mitigation and actions and effectiveness analysis of how well those interventions worked, and then back to the next project. Uh, this is an architecture of an EMR that just happens to be a safe one that we built. And there's also workflow diagrams that you can do in informatics, which are uh, like process control charts, but they're, um, they show you the dependencies between actors that helps you to understand 
what the critical points are in your um, in your workflows currently and to do an assessment of them to see what could be improved or eliminated. So the idea is to make changes where our measurements fall short of our goals and uh, make them clinically driven. Our quality and patient safety committee should all be working on this and improve our practice to optimize our quality and safety, you know, as shown by longitudinal performance measures, not guessing or by through advertising, but instead through data. And minimize, optimize our clinical workflows and practice efficiencies so that we can afford to give the kind of care that we really want to and align uh, our processes with the people that we work with. So it's not just we're doing a good job, but everybody around us is not, and therefore we're in trouble. So we we actually started out, we were third to the worst in our region in our payer measures, and we got to the top by doing quality checks. Here's a quality check for a provider, and we have different uh, uh, measures that we're looking at for this provider. And we have them against their peers and against a uh, goal. And we continue to have those and put interventions in place in order to do that. We can track it over time for that provider. We can track it over time for a whole practice. And these, these weren't month to month, but they were each month there was a year retrospect so that you wouldn't see things moving fast, but you'd have true measures and not see seasonality. Here's a MedPeds group that we have that also had their data. And then you can do clinical quality interventions, and they're worth a lot of money to healthcare organizations. So um, these are clinical pathways that have been developed, including congestive heart failure, uh, community-acquired pneumonia, osteoarthritis, phenothromboembolism, surgical complication reduction, diabetes. Um, and you could have a huge estimate of what that would do for your for your organization. Um, and uh, you have to identify high value programs and use the healthcare organization to improve and control costs and use, you know, your own internal resources in, to have a change management portfolio. And that starts with a clinical library that you're going to be using. And, um, you know, example is a cost effectiveness analysis uh, and recommendations for best practice and safe practice and order sets, discharge checklists, and references. And there was, uh, we delivered some uh, information in doing so. One of the papers I like, it's an older paper, but it's by Rick Hayward uh, from Canada, who said, the number one reason why physicians uh, adopt a clinical guideline is it's recommended by a respected colleague. Um, and the goal is to identify components of these guidelines that can be easily implementable and lead to measurable improvements in care, and that where you can make process changes that help everybody to be more likely to do the right thing and less likely to have harm, and then to have an implementation program that measures the outcomes associated with it. So the, the whole idea of evidence-based guidelines is cl clinician decisions and trials lead to outcomes. Those lead to data pooling and analysis and publication. There's an evidence-based review process that creates a guideline. Then there's a guideline implementation process that yields clinical feedback that yields new decisions and trials. So this can be pathways or process or implementation. Uh, it's, it's important that you know that. And the idea is to get clinical transformation. This involves all participants in the patient's care. It crosses between sites of service and takes care of the person 24 by seven in the community and creates, uh, this is a, we did one on CHF, I'm gonna show you. Um, and this is transition care management and case definitions, what the nurse should do, what the dietitian should do, what the physician should do. And there's basic data that supports it and outcomes data that support how much this is worth to all the organizations that can justify putting the cost toward it. And then, um, that that numbers on there were just if you had a twenty percent improvement in your um, in your your measures, um, and then uh, we looked at what the features were that were actually happening. So not following strict diagnosis, inadequate diuresis, overly aggressive diuresis leading to renal failure, failure to adjust patients' medicines as their diet changed, inadequate discharge instructions, unclear dietary instructions, lack of patient 
understanding regarding their medicines, unclear instructions, of the importance of weight monitoring, and what are the triggers in order to get back in touch with the healthcare organization uh, and not getting follow up. So there's all these things that uh, can be identified, and then they you can go through for each of the people, including the patient, and say what their roles and responsibilities are. And I'm not going to read these to you because you've got a lot to go through. Um, but you know the clinical workflow is pretty uh, extensive, and we did this for community acquired pneumonia, osteoarthritis, VTEs, surgical complications diabetes. Um, oh, and uh, then we looked in the most expensive diagnoses coming to the ER in New York to try to help people figure out what to focus on. Uh, then we looked at sur reducing surgical complications, and we looked at a lot of the, the, the subtypes of that. And then we, we looked at how we look at mortality. And the idea is when you have low mortality, you want to model what these people are doing. When you have high mortality, you want to you want to figure out what's going wrong up here, right? And here's the people who are doing better than you expect. So the, those are the things you really want to concentrate on. And then if you break it out by the different types of things that are challenges, you can see that there are groups of people that you can look at for each of these that are in best practice and some that are are actually needing improvement. And these are just uh, restating some of these things for surgical cases. I'm just going to go past those. Because, of, and then we had example order sets, and uh, this was a surgical discharge checklist that people would use and just and examples of good discharge instructions that people could use. Then we published a paper, uh, which was the first paper on full e-quality or fully automated electronic quality monitoring. And this was at the VA looking at uh, people who had redo disability exams and, uh, and how we could model uh, very subjective questions and that that could lead to improved um, care and improved uh, exams by doctors so that they met the guidelines and were more able not to have to do a repeat exams. The VA was doing 490 million in redo exams at the time, and they needed a way to get more consistency across them. And uh, then uh, we uh, modeled the NISQIP criteria, which is the National Surgical Quality Improvement Project and uh, use the software that we have in the NLP in order to do the biosurveillance and found that we could do as well as very highly trained nurses. And then we did a project for the CDC on biosurveillance of influenza data. And, uh, and you know, this is when uh, Hillary Clinton was still uh, the senator for, for New York and she sent a really nice letter thanking me for my service to the country. My kids thought I was really cool. Um, anyway, um, and this actually looked at using the whole record rather than chief complaint fields for biosurveillance of the flu season. And it was much more highly effective. And this was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine with some CDC colleagues. Um, and then we've done some work on, on new ways of doing biosurveillance using um, a a uh, the microbiome to uh, to help out, and this had to do with ways where we could search microbiome data from around the world, knowing what's coming toward us, and see what is infecting certain population or colonizing certain populations. With the idea that that things that populations are colonized with will be more likely what they become infected with, and we were able to show that that was the case indeed by some infections that were this one we did was highly virulent Klebsiella pneumonia using its genetic signature. Um, and uh, we have another one that we did uh, that we published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research. Uh, this is a, a Pfizer funded study uh, where we looked at biosurveillance of uh, non-valvular AFib and uh, seeing if we could decrease uh, strokes and death. Uh, we used the Chads VASC and the uh, Hasblad scores, uh, which were modeled. 
And what you can see here is that the uh, NLP, in addition to using structured data, how much did the NLP add to that? You can see here's what the structured data looked like in its model. Here's what the NLP looked like, and here's what the gold standard doctor's distribution looked like. And you can see that it's a lot closer, the doctor you saw a lot closer with the NLP than, than uh, they were to the original work with just uh, administrative data. And the ROC curves were a lot better for that. For And uh, and then it turned out that this is a big problem. And then we also looked at the cost. There was an extra $102,680 in cost in the year before a stroke and the year after the person had a stroke in our data. So we could get then cost effectiveness um, data out of it. So what it showed was that if we implemented this system that we would treat probably almost another 4 million people that we would prevent it just in the first year, 176,000 strokes, that we'd save over 10,000 lives and that the program would save $18 billion. And even with the cost of it and the complications of treatment, it's still 13.5 billion. And uh, this was adjusting for inflation over the five-year period of the study. Um, and so we think that natural language processing is not only highly accurate, but also is now providing transaction speeds that are, are critical for what we need to do and can do the kind of biosurveillance that would make the country stronger. Um, that, uh, that we need to do this in order to get semantic interoperability, and that will allow us to do cross-validation of data and a variety of data types to ensure accuracy and get standardized phenotypes that we can use to exchange with people that we do business with or do research with. And that clinical decision support will assist clinicians by being triggered in this way to help to put guardrails around them so that we don't throw gutter balls anymore. And that biomedical informatics partnering with clinicians should lead to safer and more effective clinical care. And it's a field that's more than computers and medicine, we have uh, clinical informatics, which is a new ABMS approved medical specialty that trains clinicians as subspecialists uh, from any primary specialty. Um, and uh, we think these will be the future leaders of healthcare and health care organizations. That um, the evolution of healthcare really is this virtuous cycle where we take what we learn from uh, precision medicine and apply it in our practice. We do trials and then use implementation science to continue to improve the care that we give. And this virtual cycle leads to a learning healthcare environment. So in conclusion, technology and standards have progressed where NLP is a viable solution. Uh, the uh, accuracy of NLP is, can be quite good and uh, that it can support traditional research, but also it can be the input to more safe and less biased AI, big data science, and uh, electronic quality monitoring and clinical decision support, which can lead to better care for patients. So just wanna close with a few quotes and then take questions. Um, the first is from uh, Machiavelli from 1505, who said, there's nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things, because the innovator has for enemies all those who've done well under the old conditions and only lukewarm defenders and those who may do well under the new. And this is just as true today as it was back in 1505. So it just shows you where we are and where we've come. So my favorite quote is from Peter Drucker from Harvard, who said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Come create the future with us. We're very excited to work with you all. Um, and this is Mont Saint Michel. It uh, is in northern France, and it took a thousand years to build. And the third and fourth generation of this monastery, which is on an island that's that's uh, uh, surrounded by three sides by water and in, in uh, low tide and all around water and high tide, and um, the third and the fourth generation that worked on this knew for sure they'd never see the end of their work, but they did it anyway. And my challenge to you is to pick problems that are worthy of your intellect, just low-hanging fruit that, that's easy to prove. 
But even if you don't solve the whole problem, you'll make a dent in it. And that is a dent that people can build on. And you'll be part of a very large solution at the end of the day. Um, so please, thank you so much for your kind attention. And I'm very, very happy to answer any questions whatsoever about um, anything in the talk or anything about you know, biomedical informatics uh, or artificial intelligence. And uh, here's my bright smiling face if you want to ask questions. I know I went through things pretty quickly, but I was really scared that we were going to go over. I actually made it in time and left time for questions. So I'm going to look at the Q&A here. Can I compare Epic and Cerner? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'm bold enough to do that. So uh, I would say that, um, that they cover basically the same space, but um, there are things that Epic's good at and there are things that Cerner is good at. So Epic has taken, I think, more time in terms of their user interface and been able to, um, you know, create better clinical workflows. Cerner is better at lab systems. They started out as a lab company, and their laboratory systems are are more highly refined than than Beaker, which is the 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 product from Epic that um, covers the same space. Neither of them uses standards in the way that I would like them to. Uh, I would like them both to um, adopt you know, standards in a serious way and be able to fully embed SNOMED Loink RX norm and modeling into their architectures. Um, I'd like all of these EHRs to open their fire appliances so that when they haven't come up with a utility that we need, that we can build one and attach to the patient's record that way. And with consent of the patient, we should be able to do so as per the 21st Century Cures Act. And then there's a uh, another question from an anonymous person who said, can you explain more the role of EHR data analysis in the patient safety work, right? So it's very clear that administrative data gets you only so far. In our study, we were able to show that there was a significant difference between uh, how well you can represent the condition of the patient with administrative data sets like ICD uh, versus the EHR data that's in the chart. And certainly you'll have process outcomes in claims data, but you won't have actual outcomes. Now there's some claims that are starting to get into outcomes like BMI weights and hemoglobin A1Cs that are being captured now for the first time in the last few years, right? But for the most part, most of the outcomes are still in the EHR data. And so being able to utilize the EHR data, understand uh, what the the um, flaws of the EHR data are, uh, just like the flaws of of administrative coding, uh, are something that one has to understand if you're going to do research with it, and then bringing this into the practice through clinical decision support to enhance patient safety requires a deep understanding of not only the data but also the clinical workflows and the processes that you're trying to affect so that you get the data to the right place at the right time for the right person um, and, and make it easy for them to do the right thing so that, you know, the path of least resistance is best practice. Let's see, I may have some more coming up. So uh, we make the BMI investigator available uh, and it's, if you want to, get access to our data with it, um, then come and uh, talk to us and we'll get you on the IRB and whatever, or, or get you access with uh, as a collaborator. If you want to implement it with your own data, um, then uh, that's a different type of collaboration. And uh, we want you to talk to us um, It be, because we're main, actively maintaining it and making it better all the time we want to be in touch with people rather than just um, you know post the code. Uh, but we do think that 
because it's a very complex system, especially with the NLP part, but we're happy to talk about it. Um, and, and we don't, you know, charge really for the use of the system, but if we have to do a lot of maintenance work, it'd be great to get our costs covered um, for people. So, but we we're happy to have people use it and uh, we've made it available um, to people around the country through the CTSA consortium and we'd love to do it through the CDC. And then it said, uh, oh, someone really liked the presentation. Thank you very much. Is the tool predicting the chance of opioid dependence treatment currently in use? Yes, it is. It's currently in use. We have that. And uh, and I think another version is coming out shortly. Um, if someone wants the model, um, if you could write to me and we could figure out how to get it to you, that would be great. And uh, we'd like uh, you to, um, you know, quote our papers, you know, and, and you use it and you publish about it. And if it helps with patients, we want to get it implemented and we'd be happy to be part of a multi-center trial to do that. Um, and then it says, are there any concerns about reliance on technology for patient safety that they ignore clinical judgment? Well, I, I don't think we should release any technology for patient safety that ignores clinical judgment. So what that means is that um, for the most part, these are not closed loop systems. So a closed loop system would be, let's say you took in ventilator data and you took in the blood gas and it automatically adjusted the vent settings. Most of what we're talking about is not that. Most of what we're talking about is providing advice and capability at the point of care to a clinician for them to actuate. Um, now, I'd like to go so far as to say, let's say there was a tool that said, you know, has my mom gotten all the care she's supposed to get, right? There's a button and you could press that button and it would spit out all the, the services that she's not had that she really should have. And then I'd like to see another button or automatically that that gets loaded in as orders uh, in the task list for the clinician and then the clinician would go in and see them, can look them over, and in one stroke, you know, get rid of some, keep whatever they want, and then just approve the ones that they didn't get rid of in one fell swoop. So it's very easy for the clinician to make happen all the things that aren't happening and should be happening for, for your mom or anybody else's. I mean, dads too, but moms are more evoking. Okay, so... Oh, has I applied this to hep C? I have not, but I have the data and we could build one for hep C. If you're interested in that, talk to us. We'd be interested in working with you to uh, create a machine learning model for hep C. There's a, a large program that has a large rural population in our area that is um, has a bunch of data that I bet we could get access to for that purpose. And let's see, where am I? Time, 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 time. I'm still good. Any other questions? I'm monitoring the Q and A here, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has about this. In general, we really like to collaborate with you. We want to. Our mission is to create good in the world, and we just want to do it as much as we can wherever we can. Oh, did I answer the standard question? Standard question, standard. Was there a standard question? Uh, Leland, which is the standard question? Oh, I see. What is your recommendation for which standard to use to for building an ontology? Okay, um, I missed that one originally. Let me answer that. So first, if there you should look at the the ontologies that exist already to see if they'll handle your what you need if you've already got what you need and the current ontologies please use them um, there are a number of places to look uh, one is nomad Lonkarix norm but the other is the obo foundry um, and you can look at the at the bio portal that stanford runs they have all of them up there and uh, you can look at all of the Oboe Foundry ontologies, see if there's one that does what you want already. 
If you don't have one, um, many people use protege to craft the ontologies, but it's less important what tool you use, but then what methodology you use. And you want to use a, a well-founded methodology to craft your ontologies. And we have, we believe, the largest ontology group in the country at University of Buffalo. So if you have a need to learn more about ontology, we have people who do nothing but work in that area that would be interesting to, for you to, to speak with. And let me know and I can, I can get you in touch. Um, please, uh, Jen, uh, write me at elkinp.buffalo.edu, elkinp at buffalo.edu, which is my email address, and I'll get you in touch. Um, an anonymous attendee says, um, I like the idea of pushing a button and see uh, what might be missing needed for your mom, dad, patient, but how do we get all the systems to talk to one another? I find that if you're seeing physicians in multiple facilities, they're not the same and they don't share or talk to each other properly. Right. So this is to do with interoperability. Interoperability is still a big problem. Um, by using the standards that we're talking about, we actually improve interoperability. There's no question about it. And, and by using standard observational databases to combine data, we're able to take the data from each of these systems and put them into a, a regular standardized form. There's three commonly used observational databases in this country. One is uh, OMOP uh, the, from the Odyssey Project. Another is I2B2 from MGH. And the third is uh, PCORnet from PCORI. Um, and you should look at all three models, see what uh, seems to be um, most to your liking. And then I think you have to code the details in ontology. And I'm still working with all of these uh, observational databases to try to get enough machinery incorporated into them that they can hold very detailed ontologic encodings, which I think is what's necessary for true semantic interoperability. Uh, and thanks for that. Okay. Another question is how can you use machine learning to be employed in a rural system where the electronic infrastructure is limited and non non-existent? They may be underfunded. Absolutely. So through interoperability, you can uh, you can bring the data from wherever it is. So let's say you get care in a very rural area and you go to a, a community hospital. Now, due to the 21st Century Cures Act, if I have the patient's permission, I can go into their EMR through a fire, a smart on fire connection through a fire appliance and pull in a record and I can put it into a standardized database at my institution with the patient's permission. Now you can do that all over the country. So I can be in Buffalo and do a national trial where I'm pulling in data for everybody's EMRs and transforming it into a standard observational database and then indexing it in SNOMED, LOINC, and RX norms so that I have commonality of meaning and then use that data to create machine learning algorithms and then redistribute them to those areas. And if I want something that's specific to rural America, I would take uh, the sites that are rural and use those to be part of the training set. I want my training set to look as much like the people who are going to use the machine learning algorithm as possible. That's how you avoid bias. So I think that's a wonderful question. Thank you. It says, uh, Elise says, you mentioned working on tracking clinicians following the guidelines. Where the health system moved from last to first place. Can you give citations for that work? Uh, yeah, I can give citations for the um, the work. Yes, I can, and it's uh, I have it in the presentation, and I will give out the presentation. Um, we the individual data from our clinicians. We didn't publish the data itself because that's real people's performance, and that could be you know sometimes you know we we don't want it to be a punishment. We want it to be an incentive for doing better. Um, so it's an, a learning opportunity, but showing how you can do it and the models, those are all available. And we think that's a very important thing to be doing. I'd like to see that done nationally uh, for chronic disease and for acute disease. You know, we, we should get best practice. And if you look at the work that we did on that for, for non-valvular fib, which was very detailed, 
Um, and, it, and it was the first time where we did the right thing. We didn't ask the question, you know, is detailed encodings better than nothing? Or it, what we said, and we didn't say, is it better than administrative data? What we said was, given that you already have administrative data, how much accuracy does it have to add the additional detailed encodings from the record? Which I think is the right question. And, and we showed that it was quite a lot. So it's it's really important. Um, it was something like a 32% improvement in the accuracy. And so that um, JM, JMIR publication, I think would be the one I'd point you to first. And, uh, and I'd be happy to collaborate on any other projects that are interested in doing that. I, I honestly think that there's a huge opportunity in biosurveillance for all diseases. If I can get back the country $13.5 billion in one year for non-valvular AFib, what could we do with CHF? What could we do with, uh, with asthma? What could we do with, um, with uh, venous thromboemboli? What could we do with all these other opportunities that we have out there, right? We can really make a huge difference and that money coming back into the system could be used for patient care uh, and and giving people you know care that maybe can't afford it um, and uh, making technology more widely available in rural areas where they maybe can't afford it right um, so there's lots of opportunities for us to make a difference okay someone asks um, it's an anonymous. Uh, I found through experience that my mom, that the weakest link for outpatient care are frontline staff who are responsible for referrals, appointments, sharing information, any way to capture that electronic system so that it can be improved. Yes, that is actually is, is captured. It is captured. So if you have an order for a referral, it's captured. The date and timestamp for that is captured. And the date and time stamp for when the referral was closed, meaning it was made to the person, especially if it's an electronic referral, is captured as well. And it should be able to be in, you know, interrogated and you should be able to know. Now that doesn't solve that you don't have enough front desk staff. That happens all the time, but it can point out that you need more, more desk staff. And um, you know, sometimes the systems are clunky in the way that they do their referrals. Frankly, I think that we should make schedules more open so that people can make appointments. So if I had a patient in my office and I could get on some subspecialist calendar and say, oh, Dr. Uh, Dr. X has a, an appointment next Thursday at two, can you make that? And if they say, yes, I'd like to be able to put their name right in and then I close that appointment right there. And if I could do that, then I would know my patients have the referral. I wouldn't have to wait for somebody else to do it. So I really would like to see that in my office. Oh, I don't know if I saw the one. That... Well, yeah, I did. Yeah, I get, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did answer that one on uh, Elisa's question. Let's see, where are we? Okay, we've got a few more minutes, guys. Um, any other questions that you would like to ask or you guys are getting me excited. I like the passion. Keep it up. Ask harder questions. Or tell me something you know to be true. So now I hope everybody is excited about, uh, oh, I got some more questions, which is good. Okay. So I do not know that AI was used in the guidelines for SARS-CoV-2 therapeutics and immunizations, but there's been a lot of AI that's used in the research around them. So for example, when we gave data about, uh, we used AI in data about creating uh, the 
where we found that the leukotriene inhibitors produced a mortality advantage in hospital patients, inpatient mortality advantage in, in SARS-CoV-2 when added to dexamethasone. That uh, we think was a pretty cool thing. And at the time, it was the only thing that gave you a mortality advantage at all. And it had basic science behind it because it decreased IL-6, which is a bad prognostic indicator in COVID and in ARDS. And so uh, when you've decreased IL-6, you decrease some of that bad reaction your, your body does to the SARS-CoV-2 and decrease the chance of ARDS and some of the lung damage. And so we thought that there was actually basic science behind the thing that we found clinically and help people to avoid death events. It says, can you comment on takeaways for developing AI models for population level research and forecasting? Yeah, the number one thing, Stephen, I would say is ensure that your training set looks like who you're going to use the, the data on. So there was a, a candid example of an approved um, system for identifying diabetic retinopathy. It was done in Norway. The first time it was used on an African-American woman, it didn't work because it was all their training set were Caucasians. And, and that's biased. When your training set doesn't look like the people that you're going to be using it on, it's not guaranteed that it's going to have a good outcome. So spend a lot of time on that. Will we have user-friendly intuitive EHRs? Fabrice, from your mouth, you know, to, I guess God's ears, I don't know. Did I, I am hoping for that. Uh, I do not see it yet, but I, I've been a, a big advocate for that my whole career and would look forward to working on such an EHR when it becomes available. Thank you for your good thoughts. Emila says, is it hard to determine prevalence in order to determine the predictive positive value, uh, it seems that this may be a weak link for determining the accuracy of machine learning algorithms and other tests. So, so this again gets back to whether your population that you're training on is similar in the in the constitution to the people who you're going to be running the algorithm on after it's built. If the if the people that you're training on truly look like the population that you're going to use it on, then then you should be able to get the right prevalence for these. And you can control for that in some regards in your initial selection of the patients. But thinking like that makes you heads and tails above your competition already. So I'm glad that you asked that. And is it Emil or, or yeah, Emily? I think it's Emil, but I'm not sure. Okay. An anonymous uh, attendee says, any advice for trainees interested in getting involved in this type of work, skills, knowledge, competencies, uh, uh, come uh, work in, in biomedical informatics. We teach all this and we do it in the context of a very deep understanding of the underlying data. One of the differences between us and you know a biostatistician doing machine learning is that we have a deep and, and abiding understanding of the, of the strengths and the weaknesses of the underlying primary data. We understand how it gets recorded and how it gets put down and who does what and how that reflects on the quality of the data and how to do the data cleaning and the data governance and provenance and how we do data visualization makes it important. And then what kind of cross validations need to happen in order to be assured that you're gonna get valid results. So um, come work with us. And if you wanna take a, we do offer a master's and a PhD and an undergraduate program. And we have postdoctoral fellowships in both science and in clinical informatics. Um, so Vicky asks, and we also have a summer program in R25 that I think we're going to put in the chat to everybody, or Lilian put in the chat to everybody, that will pay people over the summer to come work with us if you want to. It's uh, we we're favoring people who are underrepresented in medicine, but uh, we'll take applications from all comers, and we have twelve slots, and we pay I think five thousand for the summer um, for a ten week program uh, for those of you who are interested in such a thing. Um, and then Vicky asks, while this is geared towards the clinician setting, I'm interested in data mm -hmm. that public health can have access to to create better programs for prevention. Absolutely, so am I. And mm -hmm. I think I think we can, with, with consent from the patients, we can get everything. It's no longer up to hospitals to give the data. It's now mm -hmm. 
now, uh, after the 21st Century Cures Act, it's the patient's decision. And if we can get the patients to say they want us to have the data, we should have direct uh, ele electronic access to that data. And, and we should be using it for good, right? So to make the world a better place. So anyway, and I, I, I'm dedicated to that. And we should also make it cost effective, right? We should, as we do it. Uh, let's see, John from New Zealand. Oh, way cool. Uh, so uh, MedInfo is going to be, which is our big international conference, going to be in Sydney this year in July. So I hope you'll consider attending. Um, and you hope that AI will help address underserved populations. And I expect that you address this in the Q&A, but yeah, no, Indigenous, you know, this is very important that we do that. And that's why you build lots of machine learning algorithms. You may have to do the same out, you know, basic clinical topic for many different populations and then address the needs in those populations based on algorithms that are specific to their needs. Uh, I think that's really an important takeaway point and I'm glad that you brought it up. Uh, and then uh, Anonymous writes, uh, thank you for a great presentation. Can you comment on the opportunities and challenges on the application of AI in low to middle income countries? So, um, you know, you have to, so if they have low, uh, so for those that are in English, right, and you can model the kinds of problems that the country has, you still can probably do it using data from another country. But if you have another language, and the data is in a language that you can't use, then you need to be able to encode that in some standardized ontology, like ICD uh, is the simplest because many people people will have that for billing purposes. But if you can get a, a version of SNOMED in your language, uh, like there's one in Spanish and I believe French and German uh, that you can use um, that would be helpful um, to people who are non-English speakers. Um, and then the codes are to the same exact meaning, right? So that means that you should be able to still compare the codes and models that are built on those codes, even across uh, national boundaries, and then use those algorithms in order to help the people in those countries. So the, I always try to utilize the things that we have in the first world to assist the second and third world. Um, I think it's a it's really important way for us to stretch what we can do. Thank you, Helen, for the nice comment. Oh, uh, oh, they said, oh my goodness, AI and the workforce. So, okay. So right now, jobs in AI are, are really, you know, they're plentiful and people who know AI get jobs right away. Will AI affect some jobs? Yeah, sure it will. But what'll happen is people get retrained and they'll do they'll do different things rather than what they're doing now. So people, uh, for example, people who index the literature for Medline may be repurposed when it's done automatically to pulling out the main points of the article, the inclusion exclusion criteria and the main outcomes so that the data becomes computable and we can do meta-analyses more easily, for example. Um, how concerned am I with the AI generating predatory articles impacting the literature? Uh, everybody's concerned about this, not just me and journal editors. Uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of four or five conversations about this right now where people are very scared about this and journals are taking taking it to heart. Uh, for example, the JAMA Network published just on the 31st, uh, yeah, was that yesterday, yesterday, uh, that that chat GPT cannot be a, uh, a an author. And it's true that there can be um, misrepresentations. I think the first one I ever saw was many years ago, where a similar program, but not chat GPT, um, generated a social science paper, and it was accepted to one of the main journals. And it was all garbage, but it sounded pretty good. And I think that's where we are with these right now. They're not necessarily authoritative in any way, shape, or form, but they they read um, like it's a very high high end English writer 
who put it together. And that's dangerous because there are some people who will not look up the facts themselves. And if the facts are wrong, but the the language is authoritative in its in its form, that'll fool some some editors. Uh, and then uh, another anonymous person thank too said thank you. And then how do we keep these models up as populations change? That's important. So there's two ways to do it. One is um, to rebuild the models on a regular basis from ongoing data. And the other is, is to have reinforcement learning so that if the people who are getting the answers know when the, the AI algorithm made a mistake and when it was correct, um, they could give feedback to the algorithm and then that feedback could go into the learning cycle and help them to improve their, uh, their uh, learning by separating the cases um, eliminating them, putting the, the false positives into the true negative pile and the false negatives into the true positive pile. And I can see that we're out of time because Michael came back on. I want to just thank everybody so very much for their time this afternoon. I had a wonderful time and it's been great working with you all. Yes, thank you, Dr. Elkin. Um, that ends this uh, session of our Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds. Please join us for our next session on Wednesday, March 1st. Uh, we'll see you all then. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>